Good afternoon, everybody, um, or good morning or good night or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm so glad to be here today for this lunchtime uh, virtual book talk with my colleague, Dr. Jason Warren. Jason is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Sciences at West Point. He also directs the Countering Terrorism Center's um, Africa research profile and is a really well-established scholar who works on Africa issues and counterterrorism issues. And he's here today to talk to us about his book, The Islamic State in Africa, which you can tell from the number of tabs that uh, I have already put in it is a very worthwhile book that requires a lot of things that you need to go back to and be able to read again to think about and absorb and um, fully, fully understand. And so, so pleased to have him here today to talk about this book with American University School of Public Affairs. And we even get him to uh, teach with us uh, sometimes as a lecturer. So we're just really happy to have Jason with us today. And Jason, I'm really excited to hear your presentation um, about the book and to learn more about it. Fantastic, Tricia, thank you so much. And uh, if everyone uh, bear with me as I start to share my screen here. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, I, I am a huge fan of American University. Uh, I've spent many summers there years and years ago as a summer um, international relations camp counselor, which I don't even know if Tricia knows, um, but I, I have a really uh, fond place in my heart for American University uh, and I'm lucky enough to teach uh, there as well occasionally. Uh, so I, I'm gonna move along. Uh, and uh, again, I'm so thankful to be able to participate in this talk with you all. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk about the book uh, that my colleagues and I uh, just came out with in December. And it is focused on the Islamic State in Africa as, as the title suggests. Uh, so, so just sort of as a disclaimer before we start, um, though I could give a talk about the book specifically, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about the book, but really what I want to do is sort of give a brief overview of the book, but tie it more broadly to contemporary politics and really underscore sort of what the book tells us about the current state of play uh, about the Islamic State in Africa. So it's part book talk, but really kind of uh, as much a briefing on uh, how the book relates to, to current politics. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to spend about 30 or 35 minutes talking about all of these topics. And then really what I'm excited about is the Q&A that will follow. Uh, so before I begin, I have to uh, underscore that uh, I'm a US government employee. I work at the US Military Academy, also known as West Point. So anything I say here is uh, my opinion and mine alone. It doesn't represent the US government or any of the entities here. So uh, as, as uh, Trisha mentioned, uh, this is the book. Uh, the Islamic State in Africa. The, the title is easy enough to remember. Uh, so uh, this book came about because in 2016, I was hired by West Point uh, and the Combating Terrorism Center specifically uh, to help the CTC, West Point more generally, and the US government even more generally, uh, to understand sort of the state of play of uh, the Salafi jihadist movement uh, on the African continent. And at that point in late 2016, uh, the Islamic State was in Iraq and Syria, uh, really sort of at, at, at its arguable uh, pinnacle, right? It was, it was incredibly powerful. Uh, it had proven itself to be very deadly. Uh, but on the African continent, uh, we, I should say, and on the African continent, we were seeing that there were uh, some very powerful uh, 
um, affiliates of the Islamic State, namely in Libya, uh, especially in, well, the, the earlier part of late 2016. Uh, and so uh, when I came to West Point, I was sort of tasked with help us understand what's going on. And it quickly became apparent that people were doing sort of um, uh, individual country specific studies of, of various parts of the Islamic State or, or various provinces, but there was no sort of overarching uh, understanding of what the Islamic State was doing in, in broad kind of macroscopic terms. And so that's how this book emerged. So the book really is our attempt to paint the broadest picture possible of how and why the Islamic State found its way to the continent um, and, and what it looked like by the death of the Islamic State Central's leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, in late 2019. So these are some of the questions that the book asks. Between 2014 and 2019, what do we know about the Islamic State's presence in Africa? How did it emerge on the continent and how did it spread? Importantly, the book really tries to get at this question of what the nature of these relationships of African provinces was and is with the Islamic State Central based in Iraq and Syria. And uh, it also tries to tease out sort of the factors that will impact the future of the Islamic State on the continent. So again, this is a pretty macro book uh, that takes a really sort of big picture approach to understanding uh, the Islamic State's presence through individual case studies of the um, eight formal provinces or wings of provinces on the continent. So these are some of the main arguments of the book. And again, this is where I'm going to kind of tell you what the book generally argues without kind of going into super deep specifics. Uh, that's something you can read the book if you're interested in. But we're going to spend most of this um, time sort of doing the who's who of, of, of the contemporary situation. So some of the main arguments are as follows. Um, one of the main points that we make in the book is that the emergence of the Islamic State globally served to democratize gl global jihad. Um, and by democratizing global jihad, and this is a term that my co-authors and I um, uh, generated, we're really arguing that prior to the Islamic State's emergence, the transnational uh, Salafi jihadist uh, global order was essentially unipolar. There was Al-Qaeda uh, or nothing. And so to the extent that um, African insurgent groups sought to pledge allegiance to any particular group, uh, it was Al Qaeda or nothing. With the emergence of the Islamic State, there was this creation of this bipolar um, global jihadi order. Um, and in that sense, that's where the democratization comes. It's not a democratization of sort of greater voting rights or greater representation per se, but rather a sort of um, diversification of choices of allegiance. Uh, when it comes to understanding the rationales for why African insurgent groups pledged allegiance to the Islamic State, we really make this argument <clears throat> that they anticipated either material benefits or reputational benefits. Um, they either were expecting to get things, whether, these, whether this was money, whether it was arms, whether it was increased um, uh, training, uh, or reputational benefits, gaining more legitimacy for their, for their cause. In some cases, we show that these um, African insurgent groups that pledged allegiance and became official provinces did achieve that. Uh, in other cases, they didn't. I'll, I'll just make a note here quickly that when I'm using the word province, um, this is what we're talking about. These are essentially African insurgent groups that pledge allegiance or buy up to the Islamic State Central based in Iraq and Syria. Um, and the Islamic State Central makes a determination. Either it says, you know, we hear your buyout, we accept it, and you are now, uh, you go from, for instance, being Boko Haram to the Islamic State's West African province. It can also um, hear pledges uh, from an insurgent group in Africa or elsewhere and say, thanks, we heard you we don't confer upon you the status of province, or it can hear a pledge and do nothing. So the, the, the provinces that we talk about are insurgent groups. Uh, when we use the word province, it doesn't necessarily mean that these groups hold territory. Some do, some don't. Uh, it doesn't mean that they govern. Some do, some don't. Uh, but it means more that there has been a sort of uh, determination, a, a sort of um, uh, knighting of senses that yes, you African insurgent group, uh, as weak as you are or as powerful as you are, you are a province. You are the, the official representatives of the Islamic State on the continent. So that's just a, a brief note about of that terminology. So we also show that when it comes to the provinces that ultimately emerge, um, when insurgent groups pledged allegiance to the Islamic State Central in hopes that they would be elevated to provincial status, 
they had to prove their utility or usefulness. They had to do things that showed the Islamic State Central um, that they merited the Islamic State Central taking the risk on them um, to, to elevate them into its sort of global profile. The Islamic State um, can and did get embarrassed sometimes when it picked bad groups that ultimately embarrassed it more than it helped it. The case of the Islamic State in Algeria is one example. So one of the things we show is that when African insurgent groups pledged allegiance, um, they did different things to sort of impress upon uh, the Islamic State Central that they merited this elevation to provincial status. Sometimes this was through violence, sometimes it was through uh, the creation of propaganda, sometimes it was just by continuing to exist, uh, and sometimes they were elevated in the case of the Central African province uh, in DRC and Mozambique, just because the Islamic State Central needed to, to show that something was happening, right? So, so there were all these different sort of things that um, led groups to, to ultimately gain this recognition. Another uh, really significant point that we make in the book is that once they became provinces, right, once these insurgent groups gained this official recognition of being a province or wilaya of the Islamic State, um, the nature of their relationships with the Islamic State Central uh, was typified by what we call their existence as sovereign subordinates. And this is another term that we've created that we think is really sort of revelatory about this relationship. By this we mean, um, and it's intended to sort of have this juxtaposition of, of meanings. On one hand, these African insurgent groups were subordinate to the Islamic State Central, right? They, they theoretically should have served as agents um, to some principle, right? They should have done the thing that the, that, the, that the group on top told them to do. But in practice, what we show is that they were sovereign, right? They, they were able to do essentially what they wanted with relatively little oversight, uh, but also relatively little assistance from the Islamic State Central. Uh, and finally, though this was not part of the book, because again, the book goes from 2014 to 2019, uh, something that I've written about uh, along with uh, Trisha is that Africa is uh, the new global epicenter for jihadist violence. Um, we have, we have written a, a paper that I'm very proud of that really sort of articulates how and why um, the African continent has sort of quietly gone from a place where we knew jihadism existed to the place lamentably uh, that is um, experiencing the most deaths of civilians caused by jihadist groups in the world, outpacing South Asia and the Middle East. One of the implications of this is that it's the Islamic State's rise on the continent that has really propelled um, the African continent to be such a, a, um, a new epicenter for violence. So these are some of the big arguments that hopefully you can kind of take away and that you can expect if you elect to read the book, uh, which I hope you will. But um, what I wanna do from here on out is to sort of give you more of the contextual um, nature of, of the Islamic State um, not only during the course of 2014 to 2019, but really today. So um, the first question that we're going to ask is when and where did African insurgent groups pledge allegiance to the Islamic State? Excuse me. Uh, so if you take nothing else away from this talk, I would hope you have this mental map that I'm about to show you of where these groups exist. So this is a phenomenally useful map that I cannot claim credit for having created. This is from the African Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. If you're interested in these topics at all, uh, go there. Uh, this map is, is one that is incredibly useful. I think probably the most useful resource uh, for, for those of us who study these topics. So this is a map of the continent uh, in, we'll call it 2013, right? Before the global rise of the Islamic State, uh, as we know it today, right before the declaration of the caliphate in June 2014. And the important thing about this map is that um, in before the rise of the Islamic State, there were two sort of poles of jihadist power on the continent, um, and they were both branches of al-Qaeda. Uh, and Trisha has written uh, phenomenal works on, on uh, both of these groups. We have AQIM, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, in the Sahara and the Sahel, and Al-Shabaab primarily in Somalia and East Africa. So th there were these two major uh, transnationally linked, formerly transnationally linked jihadist groups, uh, and they were both linked to Al-Qaeda. But things started to change in 2014 with the global rise of the Islamic State, insurgent groups around the continent began pledging allegiance to the Islamic State 
and if they were lucky, becoming provinces or wilaya. So uh, in terms of a timeline, the first three provinces of the Islamic State uh, came about in 2014 when groups in Algeria, Libya, and the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt uh, pledged allegiance and in November 2014 uh, were announced to be the first three African provinces of the Islamic State. Uh, then by March 2015, the group that was previously known as Boko Haram pledged allegiance and became the fourth province of the Islamic State on the continent, changing its name on paper uh, from Boko Haram to the Islamic State's West Africa province. Uh, in May 2015, a group in the Sahara, uh, led by uh, a guy named al Sahrawi, pledged allegiance to the Islamic State Central. It was met with silence. Ultimately, it would take several years, but the Islamic State would uh, eventually, uh, and after many years, elevate it to a wing of the West Africa province, two, two wings of the same province. Uh, next in the timeline, in 2016, we see a pledge from uh, a guy named Abdul Qadir Mumin, who was a, an ideologue from Al-Shabaab, right? Breakaway uh, ideologue from Al-Shabaab, who <clears throat> sought to rise within the hierarchy of the sort of local jihadist landscape. And he viewed that breaking away from Al-Shabaab and the Al-Qaeda orbit was a sort of preferable way for him to accrue uh, sort of more prestige and more power within the sort of um, jihadi milieu. Uh, again, as in the case of the Sahara and the Sahel, it would take the Islamic State in Somalia several years to achieve uh, this validation, this utility validation, right? To show the Islamic State Central was useful enough, but ultimately it would do that. Uh, the, the next two uh, provinces that we uh, see, well, I should say it's a single province with two wings are really what I think is at the top of a lot of observers of African security's mind right now, uh, which is the, uh, two the two wings, I should say, of the Islamic State's Central African province. Uh, I could be wrong on this, but it's, I still think that we don't know the exact dates of the pledge. Uh, it's been a sort of shrouded uh, phenomenon. I, I could be wrong. There could have been some, some research that has emerged. But essentially, um, groups in Mozambique and DRC pledged allegiance, and it was announced um, by uh, 2019 that they would form two constituent wings of the Islamic State's Central Africa province. Uh, to underscore the sort of winged nature, these two winged provinces, the Central Africa province and the West Africa province, right? So this is kind of unique. Uh, so hopefully, at the very least, you walk away from this with this sort of mental map of the, the, the locations of Islamic State provinces on the continent as compared to uh, Al Qaeda branches. Okay, so that's the map. That's sort of what we're talking about. And essentially, each chapter of the book looks at um, the emergence and evolution of each of these Islamic State provinces. Okay. So that's where they are. What are some broad takeaways about these experiences of Islamic State provinces? Well, here are some big portable ideas that I hope you can kind of take away from uh, what we've uh, researched. So one is that these groups, and I think this is arguably the most important point of the book, is that these are locally directed and funded groups. They are, they are locally embedded, they're locally funded, they're locally concerned. Um, they're not globally directed and in large part not globally funded by the Islamic State Central. So this is an important distinction. These are groups that are far more driven by their local exigencies than they are directed top down. I would argue that most of these Islamic State provinces are grievance centered and not necessarily religiously fervent. Right? These are groups that have things that they are mad about. They have overlaid a, a jihadist ideology, which is for most of them, not the most important motivator. I would also argue, uh, and Trisha and I have written about this, these groups are mostly locally threatening and not in, in any individual sense globally threatening or uh, a serious threat to the US homeland. These are, these are groups that uh, create tremendous amounts of havoc for civilians in their areas of operation, for the uh, state and regional governments where they uh, exist but do not in, in individual senses pose a significant threat to the US homeland. 
I would also argue that most of these provinces are what I think of as simply iterations of normal insurgent groups and not simply by their affiliation with the Islamic State Central, a radically dangerous or unique threat per se. I, I've written a book about the Islamic State, so I'm not sort of uh, poo-pooing the, the, the importance of the question, but I do want to sort of emphasize that uh, beyond their affiliation with the Islamic State Central, it's, I think, more useful to think about these groups as sort of uh, garden variety insurgent groups more so than something that requires a completely different rethink of what they might be. Uh, despite all of these points, though, I would argue, uh, and I have, that these groups uh, are long-term presence, not a short-term fad. So some of these points have sort of minimized the importance or the, the severity of the Islamic State threat on the continent, which I, I want to sort of scale in the right way. Uh, these aren't a, necessarily a global security threat that should be the number one priority, but they matter, and they're going to be there for a long time. So these, again, are just some big, chunky ideas to hopefully uh, help all of this coalesce. So moving a little bit more microscopically, why would any of these African insurgent groups pledge allegiance to the Islamic State at all? Well, as I mentioned, um, our research has found that across all of these provinces, leaders, so individuals, or entire groups uh, anticipated either material or reputational benefits. What does this look like in practice? Um, in some cases, there was genuine theological buy-in. Members of, uh, particularly in Libya and in Tunisia, really bought into these sort of um, extremist, takfirist, um, jihadi ideology from the Islamic State Central. So there was some amount of theological buy-in, but as I mentioned, what we have seen is that in most places, this was not necessarily the primary motivator. For a lot of groups, uh, they pledged allegiance because, well, at least in the case of the Islamic State in Sinai, they had lost their, their top leadership cadre, right? So in the case of Ansar Beit al-Maktis, which is the group um, in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, uh, they had lost, uh, through Egyptian counterterrorism efforts, their senior leadership. And so in the absence of that leadership, some of the lower level people who were left were sort of aimless and looking for a global sponsor. And they sought to find that in the Islamic State Central. In other cases, African insurgent groups pledged allegiance to the Islamic State Central because the Islamic State Central reached out to them. Uh, the Islamic State Central really tried uh, to cultivate uh, allies in the form of the most powerful African insurgent groups. They did this in Libya. Uh, they did this in Sinai. In, uh, in, uh, with, the, with Boko Haram, they did this as well. An interesting sort of phenomenon is that the Islamic State tried to court al-Shabaab in Somalia, which was a, a very staunch al-Qaeda uh, affiliate, uh, away from al-Qaeda and failed. Instead, what they got was a, a single breakaway leader. Some terror groups wanted to go global, right? By pledging allegiance to the Islamic State, individual leaders uh, sought to sort of raise their profile globally. Um, and I apologize for that weird timing. Uh, in other cases, uh, to the fifth point, breakaway leaders uh, view the Islamic State as a new democratizing force beyond Al Qaeda, right? This is the notion of the democratization of jihad for the leader of uh, the Islamic State in Greater Sahara, and for the leader of the Islamic State in Somalia, they had sort of been uh, enmeshed within these Al-Qaeda networks that wouldn't allow them to progress higher. Uh, and so they viewed a break away from Al-Qaeda and the pledging to this new outfit, the Islamic State, as sort of an ideal way to, to progress further. In other cases, uh, as in Algeria, uh, insurgencies in general were just sort of struggling and to sort of infuse new, uh, new ideas uh, and new blood, uh, the pledge uh, to the Islamic State was undertaken. So uh, we'll move to this next question, which is what is the relationship between these African provinces and the Islamic State Central? Uh, this is a particularly contentious question in the study of uh, transnational jihadism generally, but I would say particularly in the case of Africa. There are some very pitched debates that go on about the relative importance of global affiliation uh, to African insurgent groups. There are some people who believe uh, on one end of the spectrum that it is all important and that uh, we should take the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda affiliation as the primary lens through which to understand these groups. And there are others on the very extreme end who say, these affiliations with Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State are completely irrelevant. We should not look at them at all. And they are just sort of a farce that, that distracts people and governments from, from the reality on the ground. 
I think the reality lies somewhere in the middle. So here's what we found about the relationship between these provinces and the Islamic State Central. If, an, if a group is referring to itself as a province of the Islamic State in Africa, it is. It, this means that they have pledged allegiance, the Islamic State has accepted them, and they have real and tangible links. And I say this, it sounds maybe sort of self-evident, but there are people who debate this, right? There, there, are, there are commentators who claim, well, the Islamic State Central is just claiming attacks of this particular group without having any real links, and there's there's no there there. That's not accurate, right? <laughs> if, if, if a group calls itself the Islamic State, a, an Islamic State province, as does the Islamic State Central, there are real links. That said, uh, despite these links being real, they've been weak. And that's what we seek to underscore is that, yes, there are links, but these links uh, are not at all determinative of how groups uh, develop and evolve. They have some impact, but they're not everything, far from it. Instead, as I've, I've sort of articulated, Islamic state provinces in Africa have significant autonomy and are no way controlled by the Islamic state central. Um, so then what does the Islamic state central gain from having these provinces, right? If these links are kind of weak, what does the Islamic state central get? There are a number of answers, but one of the points that I'd like to bring up now um, is that particularly as the Islamic state's global profile has waned, it's really looked to African provinces to bolster its image. There's this fascinating phenomenon going on right now, which I'll talk about in just a second, where in the Islamic State Central, as it's trying to regain footing in Iraq and Syria, is really um, highlighting its African province's achievements to sort of paper over the, the challenges of, of central leadership. So uh, I'll talk about this just very briefly. These are the Islamic State's claimed operations in 2021. Uh, this is data not that I have collected. Uh, follow this uh, guy, uh, Jihad underscore analytics. He does phenomenal stuff on Twitter. Uh, we all should follow him. Uh, here, this is just a brief overview to show uh, the, the, the Islamic State's, again, claimed operations in 21 and of uh, 2021. And of course, you can see here attacks centered in the Middle East uh, and South Asia, um, some in Southeast Asia. But really, when you look at the African continent, I think that this map is, is sort of striking in uh, the dispersal of attacks claimed by the Islamic State. But let's look at this a little more acutely. Um, of these attacks claimed by the Islamic State, in 2021, uh, there are 20 countries uh, where, where it claimed attacks. The white arrows indicate countries on the continent where it has claimed attacks. And so what I think is striking about this is that 14 of the 20 most attacked states in the world by the Islamic State were African, right? So more than two thirds of the places where that states, right, not aggregate numbers of attacks, but states where the Islamic State has undertaken attacks have been in Africa. Uh, from a purely PR perspective, you can understand how being able to claim attacks in uh, 14 African countries in one year is not meaningless. Here's another metric that I think is fascinating. Um, these are metrics of countries of uh, countries hosting Islamic State groups that have appeared on. Uh, the cover of Al Naba, the Islamic State's periodical in 2021. So uh, again, this is their, their main periodical where they sort of have um, sig acts, like significant actions, right? The things that they do. And so the countries hosting Islamic State groups that have been highlighted, nine of the 12 states on the cover in the last year have been African, right? This isn't a smattering, this isn't one or two, this is three quarters of the countries are African, right? And, and there's not been fantastic sort of scholarship on kind of what this African term, at least for PR means uh, quite yet, but I think that's sort of what the next phase of this scholarship is. What does Africa mean to the Islamic State Central? How is it trying to leverage these wins? Um, and to what extent uh, does it challenge sort of the qualitative nature of what the Islamic State Central views its, its overall kind of character to be and mission to be. So that's, I just think, an interesting kind of phenomenon that's going on right now. Okay, so beyond this PR campaign that I'm sort of suggesting is happening, what do we know about the relationships 
in more acute um, ways between the Islamic State Central and these provinces. Here are a few examples of what we do know uh, uh, connections have looked like beyond just media. We've definitely seen the Islamic State Central uh, sending personnel. This was particularly true in 2014, 2015, uh, particularly in North Africa. We haven't seen extensive personnel transfers um, since then, that they exist in, in, in one-off sort of phenomena. One of the things that the Islamic State Central has been really uh, interesting, uh, interestingly undertaking is using its provinces to serve as overseeing nodes for other provinces on the continent. So really Libya uh, and, and Somalia are the, or have at different times served as these overseeing nodes. So earlier um, between 2014 and I would say 2017, Libya was really sort of working to oversee what was going on in West Africa, um, the Sahara, the Sahel, to a lesser extent, Tunisia. Uh, contemporarily, what we're seeing from open source reporting is that Somalia, uh, which is a very small cell, which makes it even more interesting, is doing similar sorts of work overseeing the Southern and Eastern African development, um, not only in DRC and Mozambique, but also through some funding uh, through South Africa, which, is, uh, which Treasury sanctioned a few individuals for recently. Uh, we've definitely seen the transfer of trainings, tactics, and procedures. So, so ways to conduct violence. Uh, we've definitely seen that sort of knowledge transfer. We've seen money transfers, uh, ICECAP DRC, ISWAP, uh, Somalia. These aren't incredibly common, but they certainly exist. Uh, weapons transfers we've seen, uh, to, to our knowledge, and I, I stand to be corrected, this occurring in the Sinai Peninsula, um, particularly given uh, the, the proximity to uh, the Palestinian territories. Um, and we have some evidence of the Islamic State coordinating, informing, um, being aware of what its African provinces attacks are looking like. This all said, um, these are the instances that we have found of collaboration. This is not to suggest that these are profoundly common, that these are the norm, but rather these are almost anomalous. I mean, in, in many senses, these are the sort of bits and pieces that we've been able to gather about interactions rather than by any stretch being the norm. All right. Um, so another question that often comes up is, okay, these African, pro these African insurgent groups pledge allegiance, they become provinces. Uh, does it matter? D does it all just sort of stay the same or does their behavior sort of qualitatively get altered? Uh, and so to that, I say, yes, we have seen uh, across all of these cases, um, that once becoming Islamic State provinces, African insurgent groups become what, what we've decided to call Islamic State norm adopters. And by that, we mean they start to do more Islamic State-like stuff, um, though not necessarily because the Islamic State is telling them to. Rather, uh, they, we have seen these groups sort of pick and choose parts of the Islamic State's brand, whether it be uh, well, I'll discuss the, the, the phenomenon that they undertake, um, but really during, from this period between 2014 and 2016, 2017, right? They take bits and pieces of the Islamic State's actions uh, from its heyday and incorporate them into their own self-image. In other words, what's happening is when they pledge allegiance, um, their identities change. And in their identity changes, their actions change. What do these look like? Well, here are a few ways that African insurgent groups' behavior changes once they become Islamic State provinces. So one is we've seen this inordinate sort of adoption of beheadings as a tactic by these groups. Uh, very few of these groups uh, undertook this tactic, which became um, unfortunately associated with the Islamic State Central, but we see this becoming a sort of common hallmark of groups once they become provinces. Uh, prison breaks, uh, certainly not to say that prison breaks have not been undertaken by African insurgent groups prior, but um, in, in the vein of some of the activity of the Islamic State Central, these become uh, much more common. We also see suicide bombings as a tactic becoming much more common from groups that didn't undertake them previously. Um, the creation of media presence for most of these insurgent groups, media and, and sort of creating a public persona was never part of the goal upon becoming uh, provinces, uh, it did. 
attempting governance. Again, many of these groups uh, were not interested in governing, uh, but sort of in the vein of the Islamic State Central, we see that happening. Um, and, and what I think is really interesting is this sort of really ambitious uh, city takeover impetus that we saw, uh, we've seen in Libya where, where it occurred uh, in where the Islamic State's um, folks took over major parts of Derna, uh, Sirte, uh, at times Tripoli. Uh, in the case of Somalia, the Islamic State there took over an entire town for almost two months. Um, of course, uh, in the case of Ice Cap Mozambique, uh, several cities have been occupied for lengths of time by the Islamic State. And so this sort of ambitious entire takeover of cities is another sort of um, qualitative difference that I think we see uh, once groups become Islamic State provinces. So as I'm wrapping up here, um, the, the point remains that an important reason why my co-authors and I worked on this book uh, were that we, we see the, the really negative things, the, the really horrible things that are um, uh, going on, uh, particularly with civilians um, subjection to violence by the Islamic State. And so this is not a book that is intended to just sort of paint a picture and then say, you guys deal with it. Um, on one hand, we don't go uh, incredibly deep into policy suggestions in the book itself, uh, but ultimately we have a vested interest in, in seeing a decline in the violence uh, and salience of the Islamic State brand. So uh, the following are just a few advisable and inadvisable approaches, according to Jason Warner, the guy, not Jason Warner, the US government employee, uh, about how we might deal with the Islamic State in Africa. And I'll just note that um, some of, uh, many of these have been um, generated in conjunction uh, with Trisha, uh, having, having talked about these <laughs> sorts of ideas for a, a while. So some inadvisable options. Um, first, I think it's important to ensure that we don't imagine the wholesale defeat of either Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State as possible. Uh, these ideologies were, will endure, and there's very little we can do to say, you know, Al-Qaeda will totally be gone and there will never be salience again. Uh, I, I think that that's not uh, at all an appropriate way to think about things. In terms of on the ground action, uh, there is a, a, a pitch debate uh, going on about the importance of kinetic action. In other words, um, uh, military uh, counterterrorism action. I think it's important that we do not only look at dealing with Islamic State groups through military action. I think it's a, a surefire way to fail. And in some senses that's been, been proven. Um, I think it's also very important that whether we're talking about Islamic State groups or Al Qaeda groups that we not look at them exclusively through, their, through the lens of their affiliation with Al Qaeda or the Islamic State. Again, these are local groups with local grievances, funded locally, recruiting locally, with some outside assistance uh, from time to time, but really to sort of um, exclusively look at them through these lenses of their global affiliations is not going to be a productive way to move forward. Um, I think it's also really important that we not assume that anything that happens with the Islamic State Central is gonna trickle down uh, and, and, and sort of inform what goes on on the ground. Leadership decapitation, particularly of the Islamic State Central's leadership, uh, not to mention, the leadership of particular African provinces uh, is not gonna have any impact. And in fact, what we've seen is that um, African provinces have grown stronger uh, in the aftermath of leadership decapitation uh, to include uh, after al-Baghdadi uh, died. Uh, I'll just note that a big part of this reason why the degradation of the Islamic State Central doesn't really impact African provinces is because they never really received that much from the Islamic State Central to begin with, right? So really what our book sort of emphasizes is that their, their main sort of benefit was this branding. Uh, yes, they occasionally got, uh, you know, some amounts of funding and some, some direction from time to time, but really uh, they don't miss what they never had, right? So they got the brand, the brand is resilient. Uh, and so uh, uh, problems at the top don't necessarily trickle down. Brief point that <laughs> encouraging vigilantism um, and, and sort of self-defense groups, which we've seen occur in the Sahel, is, is not a great idea. 
And I'd also argue that we should not assume that this is unimportant to the United States. Uh, I think some of you may be listening to this and being like, well, you, you just said that this isn't a global security threat. Uh, this is not threatening to the United States homeland. That's true. But this is also not something that the United States can say, well, this is, this is centered in, 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 in the Lake Chad Basin or Somalia or Mozambique, and those are not that important. Um, they will become very important, and this will become an intractable problem if it's not taken seriously. Um, so happier notes. What are some advisable options? Uh, this is what I think uh, to be determined how effective these are. I think at the core, we have to try to create sites of legitimacy more powerful than the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. What is, what is more powerful sites of legitimacy? Well, these mean either um, states that are, uh, that are uh, more capable of providing governance, more capable of providing economic uh, generation, more, more capable of providing services than Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. And so to the extent that um, individuals find affiliation with the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda as, as being more effective at helping them generate their ideal futures, right? Getting the things that they want in life, they'll do that, right? We have to figure out alternative sites of legitimacy for uh, personal uh, livelihood uh, ensuring, right? We do have to recognize that kinetic operations might be necessary, but they're not sufficient. I've, I've made this point before. Uh, we do need to give greater focus to economic and political options and not, again, look at this through the lens of CT exclusively. Um, Trisha and I have discussed this, but this is, a, I think, a, an important point. We do need to define a new metric of, su metric of success. So, uh, I think that you know, what's important to recognize is that there's going to always be some level of violence caused by these groups. I don't think these groups are going away and I do think that they will remain at least minimally violent. What we have to sort of figure out is what amount of violence is acceptable? Um, I think that a, a relook at the question of negotiations and who we do and do not negotiate with um, could be given a bit more nuance. Uh, and finally, I think global collective action is needed. Uh, this is not a problem that is um, at the top of any individual non-afflicted countries list, but collectively, uh, this is a this is a, a, a serious issue on the continent uh, that has only been shown to grow. So, um, with that, I will wrap up. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. I am uh, eager to hear your questions, uh, and and thanks very much. Fantastic, terrific uh, presentation, Jason. Thank you so much. Do you, if you want to um, take your slides down and then, then the audience will have a good chance to see you. Um, I'll encourage everybody to submit their questions in the Q&A um, function, but I am selfish enough that I'm gonna take the prerogative of the first question as the moderator. And then I, I see we already have some great questions in the chat. Um, Jason, I wonder if you could illuminate for us. You talked about what it means to be a, an Islamic State province, um, but we also have sort of these awkward configurations in Africa where you have a province that actually encompasses multiple organizations, such as in West Africa and, and Central Africa province. I wonder if you could talk about what the relationship is between the different groups when they're within the same province, but they are they appear to be just pretty much fully distinct organizations. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are different levels to think about this on, right? So in the case of the Central Africa province, it's composed of Mozambique um, and, and DRC. <coughs> in the case of the West Africa province, it's uh, ISWAP kind of core or old school ISWAP and then ISWAP in uh, the Sahara. Uh, really what's striking is that the, in general terms, even being part of the same province doesn't demand any degree or any significant degree of actual coordination. So really what I think, and I stand to be corrected, I think what most people who are looking at, at both of those case studies are really spending time doing is trying to figure out like what linkages at all exist, right? It's not, you know, how deep and how many people and, and you know, it, it's not that, it's rather, how do we piece together how and why these even were, were tied together at all? It's important to note, of course, that it's not the uh, individual province's decisions themselves as to what, what they're called essentially, right? So these are determinations made by the Islamic State Central. Um, and so when we're talking about the Central Africa province or the, the West Africa province, uh, th there could in fact be no connection 
precisely because it's the Islamic State sort of nomenclature that, that named them those things, yeah. And I think that question segues into one that, that appears, I think, in a couple different iterations in the, the Q&A, which is the question of these groups, the different provinces and the different organizations within the provinces working together to do more things on a regional basis to sort of expand their co cooperation with each other and their operations in cooperation with each other. Is that something that you, you think is a likely development in the sort of intra-Africa uh, Islamic State? Yeah, certainly. No, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, particularly, uh, I would say between 2014 and 2016, 2017, the Libya province was sort of this uh, beacon of assistance for training, really, for fighters of the Islamic State in Tunisia, uh, the Islamic State West Africa province, others in the Sahel. Uh, I think we saw some people from Algeria coming. So Libya was really sort of this, this training ground um, for sure. Uh, it also served to sort of mediate disputes. I've also talked about how the Somali province is sort of this new node that's overseeing um, uh, or, or, yeah, really overseeing the Central Africa province um, uh, locations. And so, uh, yeah, we're seeing a lot more um, a lot more sort of mutual support by African provinces for other African provinces, particularly as the Islamic State Central has lost the ability, uh, to the extent that it ever had it, to really support them. So in other words, as the Islamic State Central is declining, African provinces, as far as we're sort of seeing, are, are looking to support each other more in the absence of, of really any support from the Islamic State Central. And um, building on that, there's a question. Do you think that there's a, um, a motive for the Islamic State Central to essentially create larger and larger provinces mm -hmm. within Africa? such as a, a broader um, sub-Saharan Africa or a broader Africa province, or is it more, is it looking more to have more individual provinces than a quantity maybe rather than overarching quality? What do you see the direction of that? Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I've never thought about things in those terms. Uh, we definitely saw, I think we see more a trend towards the consolidation of provinces, right? So for instance, in Libya, there were initially three individual provinces that were consolidated into one Libya province. Um, we, it, it's in flux, I guess I would say. I, I don't see any sort of real benefit to having like an Africa province, right? Because it's it behooves the Islamic State Central to appear as though, look, we have a West African group and an East African group and a, a you know, so to that end, I, I don't necessarily see why that would be useful, but it's an interesting question that I'll, that I'll be thinking about. Yeah. Definitely a great question from one of our, our grad yeah. students here. Um, have a question from a friend and colleague at the State Department, which is essentially whether there are any um, sort of highlights or good examples mm -hmm. of efforts to combat one mm -hmm. of these provinces or one of these organizations that has been successful and, and offers maybe some lessons learned or maybe even some, some hope for strategies in other places. Yes. Um, so one example of where an Islamic State province emerged and, and no longer exists um, is in Algeria. So the, the province was declared uh, in late 2014. Um, there was uh, a, a very quick crackdown by the Algerian state um, that was um, that was serious and it was not necessarily the most uh, Sort of respectful of human rights, um, but it, it was effective. And so, unfortunately, like the, the bad news in all of this is that um, th that sort of stands out as the most effective sort of deterioration of an Islamic State province, but through what some might argue is very heavy handed um, CT pressure by the state. I'll also note uh, that I, th and I think this sometimes gets overlooked in these conversations, um, the, the, the Islamic State in Libya was really incredibly powerful. Um, and with, uh, you know, concerted international effort really has dwindled to a, a, sh a shadow of its former self, right? It, it just sort of, you know, these, these guys sort of exist in pockets um, in the desert, but really the sort of transnational uh, cooperation uh, in, in really in, in, you know, culminating in, in December 2016, that, that was useful. Um, I think the challenge in, in the challenge in all of this, of course, is that in, in an era of, of near peer competition and sort of traditional state to state um, concerns, that we, we are seeing a genuine uh, deterioration of interest in 
yeah. counterterrorism. I mean, it's I think it's as simple as that. And it's on one hand comprehensible given global developments, but on the other, uh, terrorism is not going away. These groups are not going away. They're going to, to reemerge and, and likely stronger. So trying to figure out, in other words, how to engender that sort of interest in, in transnational cooperation is, is, a, is a tough nut to crack at the moment. Yeah. Um, I'm bringing in a question from a ISIS uh, scholar, heavy hitter, and Craig Whiteside, who would like to know what you found about the nature and frequency of on-the-ground trainers from older IS provinces or IS Central. Yeah, that's that's uh, wonderful to hear that Craig is here, and he is absolutely a heavy hitter. Um, in terms of training, uh, again, it, it's back to Libya. Um, the the Sabratha camps in Libya were really um, used as, as sort of one of the main training grounds. Uh, I don't know the status of them today. Um, in other places, we, you know, like I'm thinking of Somalia, right? They like it's a small group. They like set up these training camps, but you know, and even in propaganda videos, like th they're kind of uh, <laughs> the word that came to mind was dinky, right? They're they're kind of <laughs> unimportant. They're kind of like sad uh, in some cases, and so. Uh, in, in terms of training, there's nothing that stands out in my mind, and others may may disagree uh, about sort of any really significant training presence, at least in the 2014 to 2019 period, which is what the book focused on. There may be there may be sort of new developments right now that I'm not aware of. Um, I would imagine that probably in DRC there's there's something interesting going on that I just am not uh, not sufficiently up to date on. There's a, a couple questions that are revolving around the, the same theme that I, I know you've given a lot of thought to, and that is the implications of the French withdrawal from Mali and the Russian Wagner sort of uh, infiltration there. How do you see that evolving in terms of the effort? I guess that's against both uh, JNIM and the Islamic State in Greater Sahara. What kind of implications do you see that uh, those developments having? Uh, yeah, not not great. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's not, not good news. Um, so I think it's it's fair to say uh, the, that the withdrawal uh, of the French under under Barkhane, uh, it, it, it was not necessarily the most effective effort, uh, but it was, I think, better than what we're going to see the alternative will be. Um, I think, you know, obviously we, we saw the withdrawal or the, the partial withdrawal of Barkhane. We saw the quick entrance of the Wagner group um, in Mali, as we've seen in Libya and Car and Sudan and Mozambique profoundly problematic. Uh, in, in my view, that phenomena, the, the introduction of the Wagner group, which is, I think, to the best of anyone's knowledge, the sort of gray zone, uh, their PMCs with unclear connections, at least to my understanding, with the Russian state as being really profoundly detrimental um, to, to the uh, uh, towards at least the sort of Western conception of how these, these groups might be, uh, might have their presence mitigated. Um, I spoke with someone recently who is based in Mauritania, uh, who I don't have, uh, I haven't asked him if I could sort of share his name, so I won't. Um, but, but his take on this was fascinating. And he said, what he imagines is that there will be a new jihad declared against the Wagner group. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> some of these these jihadist groups um, who are looking at particularly the, the allegations um, of, of, of wide scale, uh, I don't want to say but certainly wide scale atrocities um, that have been perpetrated allegedly between the Malian army and the Wagner group uh, in, in Mora. So uh, there, there is a potential that the Wagner group is going to attract way more attention um, on itself than even Barkhan, uh, but but it's not good. And I think, you know, this has been the case that we've been seeing this interest, particularly by JNIM and Al-Qaeda, even, you know, prior to the emergence of JNIM in 2017, having this interest in moving further south uh, towards towards the, the littoral states in West Africa. And so uh, it's, it's sort of fair game now. It's, you know, that's one of many reasons why things are looking uh, increasingly uh, bleak in my, my estimation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a couple of questions that that surround the 
the kind of general idea of fissures, uh, fissures between provinces and Islamic State core, fissures amongst the uh, provinces. Do you see the, these as a prominent um, feature of the, the network at this point? Is this an area that, that essentially could, could impose some self-inflicted wounds within this network? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, honestly, no. Uh, there's, there's, we've seen very little um, again, from, from the open source, from what we've been able to do in this 2014 to 2019 period, we see, I'm trying to think if there was any real fissures between provinces and the Islamic State Central. Maybe I the removal of Chicago, right? I'm that sorry? Whole, the removal of Chicago, that whole kerfluffle. <laughs> Well, so Chicago is a different sort of yeah. beast because ultimately, that's a, yeah, I mean, that's sort of the only one that we could think of, but that's, I, I guess I wouldn't qualify that as a kerfuffle. He got mad at, at essentially uh, <laughs> the rest of the group who, you know, the Islamic State Central in that case. So Chicago, of course, was the leader of the Islamic State's West Africa province. And then uh, the Islamic State Central sort of uh, had what we call the magazine coup, right, where they announced through this magazine that Chicago was no longer uh, the leader. Um, but in that case, it was, you know, we've been careful to sort of articulate that that wasn't the Islamic State Central making the call against Chikau, right? They, they didn't sort of say this is how it should be, but rather they, they took the opinions of, of the sort of lower level people. But yes, of course, that's, that's, you know, he certainly didn't appreciate the Islamic State Central going along with that. In other words, the way we talk about that phenomenon is that it was the Islamic State giving approval for what the rest of the group essentially wanted. But to your point, Trisha, yes, absolutely. I, I guess I should say like, they didn't love that he was using child suicide bombers. Uh, they, they didn't like the way that he was managing the group, but ultimately it was more of, of a sort of ground level uh, swell against him that the Islamic State Central approved rather than the Islamic State Central sort of unilaterally clearing him out. Yeah, that's an important yeah. distinction. Though yeah, I that's a great, yeah, great, great point. Embrace the idea of a kerfuffle because it's a word I don't really get to use that much. And so, <laughs> oh well. Yeah. Um, we have a, I think what, what is maybe a good final question to wrap up on from yeah. one of our colleagues at USAID. And that is really looking at the question of grievances, which I know that you yeah. have and how important the grievances are and how good the different um, ISIS affiliates are, or provinces are at exploiting grievances and yeah. interacting with communities in ways that exploit grievances. Yeah, I think it's incredibly important. I think it's arguably the, the most useful recruiting tool, uh, legitimation tool. It is, again, grievance-based. It's, you know, all, there's, there's so many commonalities among these provinces uh, where, in, all, in essence, they're, they're what I continue to sort of emphasize, they're sort of normal insurgent groups that have qualms against the state, uh, qualms against local governments, qualms against other ethnic groups, um, and they, they seek to legitimate those qualms through the overlaying of this transnational jihadi ideology, which they may or may not buy into. I think Anwar Bukhars has some, some fantastic work sort of um, really laying this argument bare, which is, you know, these groups don't necessarily believe in this, this transnational jihadi ideology uh, per se, they might, but at the end of the day, they're just trying to get, get things, right? They, they have things that they want to achieve. And in their estimation, overlaying this, you know, existentially legitimating um, paradigm over it, they see as a, as a good way to go about that. So at the end of the day, it's all about grievances, I would argue. It's, it's very little, uh, in most cases, about sort of protecting the global umang and you know ridding these states of, of you know apostate leaders, it's getting stuff you want and and becoming an Islamic state province for a lot of people uh, looks like a great way to do that. And have all of the Africa um, provinces declared allegiance to the new ISIS leader? Has there been any notable silences? That I do not know. I have not tracked that closely. I know that after. I think that Algeria probably has not because yeah. it's essentially defunct, um, yeah. uh, but, but uh, I think the vast majority have, yes. Yeah, so it's now, now survived a couple leadership transitions. <laughs> That's right, my, my they're, point they're good at it now, yeah. Yeah, well, of course, there were many more questions. I tried to, to capture as many as I could and, and bundle them so that, that you could get to speak about them. Um, but I also want to be cognizant of, of your time and everyone's lunch hour. But this is a really fascinating conversation. As I say, I've read the book, I studied these issues uh, as well, and I still found this really insightful and 
new things to think about and, and new really important findings to share. So I want to thank you for joining us for uh, this book talk. And I'll just one more time give it a give it a show that you know it was one it, one of our friends called it a chunky tome but chunky i think tome. it is very slim well appropriate the appropriate size tome for how much um insights and how much good material is in there um so thank you for everyone who was able to join us apologies to those of you whose questions i was not able to get to um but definitely really really worthwhile presentation and uh discussion overall so thank you again very much jason Absolutely. Trisha, thank you. And uh, a shout out to Trisha. She's one of the leading scholars on this topic as well. So uh, buy her books as well. And follow <laughs> her and listen to her much more than you listen to me. Oh, uh, but yeah, no, definitely yeah. that. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's wonderful to be here. And for anyone out there who wants to communicate, I'm uh, jason.warner at westpoint.edu. Yeah, that was very kind. It's very kind. Well, thank you everyone. Um, thanks again for coming and have a wonderful day and end of your semesters. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.